Okay, fantastic. Uh, if you're all ready, let's just start. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to third virtual ML seminar at UT Austin. It's my pleasure to introduce Virginia Smith from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Virginia received her PhD from UC Berkeley in 2017, and after that, she was a postdoc at Stanford for a year, and since 2018, she has been an assistant professor in the machine learning department at CMU. Uh, Virginia has received several awards, including Google Faculty Research Award, Carnegie Bush Institute Research Award, Facebook Faculty Research Award, and so on. And her research interests span machine learning, optimization, and computer systems. In particular, she has done several interesting works in the area of federated learning. And today she'll talk about heterogeneity in federated systems. With that, I pass it to Virginia. Awesome, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, thanks everyone for being here. I'm really glad that I can be here with you remotely. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, I've, I've been doing a lot of work recently in federated learning. Federated learning is basically the problem of training a machine learning model over a network of remote devices. So in the talk today, I'll be talking about how the setting in particular differs from prior work in distributed machine learning and specifically how the issue of heterogeneity really plays a critical role across the machine learning pipeline in federated networks. So I'm going to stop my video just in case it's uh, distracting to anyone. But um, as I'm going on, if you have any questions, please totally feel free to stop me. I don't know what the best way, you know, people typically kind of unmute themselves or if you guys work with the chat window, whatever works for me. Um, whatever you want to do is, is totally fine. So um, if I see if I if I'm missing someone, if someone's like raised their hand or um, there's something in the chat window, well, please just, just stop me. Okay, so let's start with a, a working definition of federated learning. So in federated learning, the goal, as I mentioned, is to train some machine learning model across a network of devices. So typically the objective that we're thinking of is something like an empirical risk minimization objective, where you have a sum of loss functions. So here there are n loss functions, one for each device. And the goal is to fit this objective to data that's distributed across a bunch of devices. So at a high level, the training looks kind of like this. You have some central server that you're using to aggregate updates. And you're solving this objective in an iterative fashion, where at each round, you send your current model update, W sub T, to a subset of the, the devices. Those devices then perform some lo local training and then they send their model updates back to the central server. The server then aggregates those updates and uses those updates to form the next model update, WT plus one. So the high level regime that I just described sounds a lot like prior work in distributed machine learning. So for example, training in data center settings. But there are a number of really important challenges that differentiate this setting from prior work in data center computing. So one challenge is that whereas communication is a known bottleneck in, in all distributed learning, here you might have networks of devices like mobile phones or wearable devices. And the number of devices might be in the, say, hundreds of thousands to millions. Um, so this can be a much more massive network than, say, in a data center where you might have hundreds to thousands of machines. Additionally, the network itself can be much slower. So you might be working over you know, uh, cell phones again, instead of in a, in a nice kind of you know, more uh, controlled data center environment where you have better control and, and maybe faster networks. Additionally, one of the reasons that it's, it's important to do distributed training in federated networks is because privacy is a very big concern. So this is one of the uh, key motivations for performing this distributed training to start with, which is that these devices, uh, say for example, a cell phone, uh, might be collecting some personal information. So your text messages or your you know, images on your phone. And while you may want to learn something over that data, it's also very private. And so there are really tremendous privacy concerns that come when performing federated learning that might not exist in, in other distributed training scenarios. Finally, another way that this setting really differs from uh, say the data center setting is that because the data is being generated on these devices and we're assuming that the data remains on the device that it's generated on, 
you might have devices with data that look very different than other devices in the network. So the data can be very heterogeneous. It can be very non-identically distributed across the network. And you might have some devices in particular that generate a lot more data than other devices. So this heterogeneity, by the way, shows up not just in terms of the data, but also in terms of the devices themselves. So you might have some devices that have different hardware or different connectivity compared to other devices. So imagine, for example, our running example of, you know, a network of cell phones, you might have someone with a very new cell phone that has great connectivity compared to someone, you know, with a very old cell phone with very little storage and very poor connectivity. And these differences can really make an impact in terms of how capable each of these devices are uh, to actually perform training in this distributed environment. So all of these challenges are really criti critical to consider when thinking about uh, solving this problem of federated learning. Uh, just as a pointer, if you're interested in this space or you know, you're interested in kind of learning about what has been done and, and what some future directions might be, uh, we recently wrote a white paper on the problem of, of federated learning, in, including going into more detail on some of these challenges and um, talking about some important open problems in, in this space. So while these are all super important to consider, uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus specifically on the issues of heterogeneity, uh, which, as, a, as I'll mention, play a critical role in various aspects of the machine learning pipeline in federated networks. So in particular, if we're talking about heterogeneity in federated settings, there are several questions that we might ask about how these uh, you know, heterogeneous devices and how the heterogeneous data affect various aspects of the machine learning pipeline. So one of the first questions that you might ask, uh, a very natural question is, you know, how does heterogeneity affect this training procedure? How does it affect the optimization methods that we use to train our machine learning models in federated networks? However, the effect of heterogeneity doesn't just stop with the optimization process. So heterogeneity is also important to consider once you've actually trained your model. And the reason is that the model that you've trained when you have a network with very statistically heterogeneous data, it might perform very differently on some subsets of the network than on other subsets of the network. And in particular, if you're not careful, you might have a model that performs very well on a subset of your devices, but potentially very poorly on another subset. And so it's important to think about how to provide a reasonable quality of service for all of the devices in the network. Lastly, when you have very heterogeneous data, it can be important to kind of go beyond the standard paradigms in federated learning. So one of the most common ways to, to think about fitting a model to a federated network is just to train one model for all of the devices in the network. But when you have truly heterogeneous data, it can be very important to think about how to personalize those models and how to kind of directly model the heterogeneity that you have. And so these are all really, uh, you know, important questions to think about um, in terms of thinking about how heterogeneity affects machine learning. They roughly bucket into thinking about the optimization procedure, into trying to encode models that are fair across diverse networks, and into thinking about how we should really be modeling this heterogeneous data. Uh, in federated learning. So this is a, a rough outline for the rest of the talk. And I'm, I'm going to look at trying to answer these questions. Uh, so we've looked at these various aspects of heterogeneity and federated learning uh, in, in some prior work. And uh, again, please stop me at any point if you have uh, questions about any of these topics. So first, let's talk a little bit about how heterogeneity affects the optimization process in federated networks. To start, let's talk about one of the most common ways to uh, solve this optimization objective in federated certain settings. So one of the most popular methods is, is known as federated averaging. And I'll describe this, this method very generally because it's um, also kind of relates to a class of methods which perform um, something known as local updating. All right, so the way that that works is, again, you have some central server and then some devices. So this is a, a network of, of remote devices like cell phones, for example. And when we're performing the training, we have some model update or some model that some current notion of the model that we send to a subset of the devices. 
Those devices then perform some local training. So for the case of federated averaging, this would be performing e-epics of stochastic gradient descent locally. Once that local training is done, these devices then send their model updates back to this central server where they are aggregated. In the case of federated averaging, the updates are simply averaged. And then they're used to find the next model update, WT plus one. So uh, this sort of method, so federated averaging again is kind of one example of this general local updating procedure. Uh, but federated averaging in particular is nice because it's a very simple method. It's, it's widely used. And one of the reasons is that it works remarkably well in practice for a lot of problems um, in federated learning. One issue with federated averaging and with these local updating methods in particular is that they can diverge in heterogeneous settings. So even though these work well for a lot of problems, their convergence specifically with heterogeneous uh, data and systems is not guaranteed. So to, to tell you a little bit more about what I mean by that, um, let's look at the performance of federated averaging on a, on a, a common federated learning data set. So this is a, a next word prediction data set um, called Shakespeare. And for all of the plots today, I'll be showing kind of the same uh, a general plot. So on the x-axis, we have the number of communication rounds. And on the y-axis, we have the training loss. So the goal in plotting the convergence of this optimization method would be to get down to the bottom of this plot you know, as quickly as possible. That would mean that you're quickly converging um, to a good solution in terms of the training loss. And what you see is that when we apply federated averaging to this real data set, which is statistically heterogeneous, if you're not careful, if you do too much local work while you're performing this federated averaging procedure, you can start to converge to a much worse solution. So if you look at the training loss, um, you know, not only are we converging sometimes more slowly, but we're actually not converging to the, the same training loss that we were when we were using a smaller number of local epics. So the key idea here is that these local updating methods can work well for a lot of problems. But when you have heterogeneous data, you really have to be careful about deploying these methods. And in particular, too much local work can really hurt convergence in this setting. By the way, I'll just mention, this plot is in terms of training loss, but you see the same performance in terms of test accuracy as well. So if you look at the same plot, um, but now in terms of the, the test accuracy of, of this model, you see the same sort of performance. So it's actually converging to a worse solution, both in terms of the, the training performance and the generalization performance. Uh, Ginger, what is the what is the the problem and the models you're averaging here? So this is a um, RNN. This is a recurrent neural network that we're using to um, to train a next word prediction model. So the Shakespeare data set is is kind of a fun one. So what's done is that you take the complete works of William Shakespeare, and then to model that as a federated network, you take each of the characters in each of the plays, and you assume that each character or each character in one of these plays is like a user in your system, basically. So you have some text data for each of these characters and you model each of those characters as a device. That's fun. That's, that's, that's really, that's really good, good idea. Yeah, I see. So, and it's, a, it's an RNN that you're training here. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, I have a quick question uh, in the previous slide. So is the batch size same across the local SGD? Yes, the batch size is the same. The only thing we're changing here is the number of epics. Like local SGD box, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, good question. Okay, so keep in mind, this is just at this point considering only the issue of statistical heterogeneity, which intuitively, like in this example we just gave with like Shakespeare is that some of the characters in these plays might speak differently than other characters, right? So it's intuitive that the data distributions across each of these uh, devices might differ in the network. So the performance that we're seeing here is just due to statistical heterogeneity. If you, in addition, include the issue of systems heterogeneity, things can really start to degrade. So what exactly do I mean by systems heterogeneity? Well, one of the ways that heterogeneity is, is tackled in practice is that if you have devices that have different uh, computational capabilities to uh, perform local training at each round, and you see that some of the devices are not 
able to compute their local training within some window, what's very commonly done in practice uh, is to just drop those devices. And what you can see is that if you do this and you have, uh, you know, if you have no stragglers in the system, like in this first example, and you're just looking at statistical heterogeneity, the performance can be, you know, somewhat variable in terms of the, the convergence behavior. But then when you have this issue of systems heterogeneity on top of this, which is that some number of the devices, you know, might not be able to complete their, their local training within the allocated time window, and you're dropping those devices, you can really start to get very erratic behavior. And this is an extreme example, you know, where we have 90% of the, the data being stragglers, uh, sorry, the devices being stragglers. But the, the key idea here is uh, that systems heterogeneity, you know, this, this idea of there being stragglers in this, uh, the network, which is very common, and the, the common technique of just kind of dropping those devices, this can really exacerbate these convergence issues that already exist due to statistical heterogeneity. All right, so how, how can we tackle this? In this work, FedProx, uh, we made the following modification. So uh, we took the local subproblem that's being solved on each of the devices with federated averaging, and we made the following simple modification, which is that we're adding a proximal term to the objective. So this is a very common tool in optimization. At a high level, the, the takeaway here would be that this proximal term has the effect of limiting the impact of these heterogeneous local updates, right? So our intuition with federated averaging and where things were going wrong is that when we do too many local epics, so we do too much local training, we can start to uh, have this poor convergence behavior. And so what this proximal term does is it helps to limit the impact of those updates, especially when you have heterogeneous data. On top of this, we also made the following modification, which is that now that we have this way to sort of safely incorporate updates with variable performance in terms of, you know, the statistical heterogeneity, we can also help to use this to incorporate devices that have variable performance because of the system's heterogeneity. So instead of dropping devices, we are allowing all devices to send their partial work and because we have this proximal term, we're effectively incorporating that work in a safer way. So I'll show you what I mean in just a second. Okay, but at a high level, this is what is being done with FedProx. So we take the, the subproblem that was solved originally in this federated learning procedure, and we add this term that helps to limit the impact of, of heterogeneity. I wanted to know that this is a generalization of, of federated averaging. Uh, in particular, it's quite general in that, you know, in federated averaging, you're typically using SGD locally. Here, you can actually use any local solver. So our analysis and our method uh, follow if you want to use anything locally. So, you, you know, you could use some uh, accelerated method or you could use even like a second order method or something locally to solve this subproblem. So everything that we have derived is agnostic of that. Okay, so one other thing that's nice about this proximal term, so as I'll show you in just a moment, not only does this significantly improve our empirical performance, it also allows us from the theoretical perspective to guarantee the convergence of this, this method, even when we have statistically heterogeneous data. And the way that, that we're doing that in particular is by understanding how the data differs. So we have an assumption on how much heterogeneity there is in the network and we show our convergence guarantees with respect to that heterogeneity. Okay, so here's, here's a high level look at, at those convergence guarantees. And uh, I'm not going to go into too, too much detail here. There's actually been a lot of nice follow up work that, is, that has kind of tightened these bounds in various ways. But when we were first looking at kind of deriving something for this method, the key thing is that we, we really wanted to look at the most difficult setting in terms of really matching what's happening in practice. So we looked at trying to show that this method converges despite using non-identically distributed data across the network, despite the fact that we're performing this local updating procedure, and despite the fact that we may have only you know, a, a partial view of the network. We might have some devices that uh, either don't participate or begin participating uh, but then, you know, may potentially drop out, for example. So we have partial participation um, and we, we cover that as well with these convergence guarantees. <clears throat> so I mentioned that our convergence guarantees depend on an understanding of the heterogeneity in the network. 
what we're using here is a notion that we're referring to as B dissimilarity. So this uh, characterizes how heterogeneous your data is. At a high level, what this is measuring is just how much the local gradients differ from the global gradient. So if this term B is equal to zero, it would mean that your data is perfectly IID across the network. If this is, you know, sorry, if B is one, if B is greater than one, then the data is not identically distributed. I wanted to note here that this is, this notion has been looked at previously, though, for, for different purposes. So this is more commonly known as gradient diversity. And what's interesting, I think, here is that in, in this uh, convergence, um, in our convergence guarantees, we're showing that dissimilarity has sort of, you know, uh, the heterogeneity has a negative effect on the convergence behavior. This gradient diversity term, though, has been used previously um, to show that diversity is an important ingredient in actually speeding up other methods like mini batch SGD, for example. So, whereas diversity can be useful if you're thinking about something like mini batch SGD, here we're kind of showing that there are some perils to diversity, uh, in particular in, in federated settings when you're performing these local updating methods, heterogeneity can really slow your convergence. Okay, so <clears throat> um, at a high level, what we show is that we're able to get this one over epsilon rate of convergence with this FedProx framework. And uh, this convergence guarantee, uh, as I mentioned, depends on the heterogeneity of the network. So intuitively what's happening here is that the higher this B parameter is, so the, the more heterogeneous your network is, the, the larger you have to set this mu term in the, the, the prox term in, in FedProx, and that will have the effect of sort of slowing down your convergence rate. At the same time, you have the benefit that this actually is guaranteed to converge to the correct solution. Okay, so these, these results are, are also quite general. So they cover both convex and non-convex losses, and they're totally independent of the, the local solver that you're using. So the high level assumption we make is just that each of these local subproblems is solved to some, uh, some accuracy, and then the convergence rate depends on that accuracy. Okay, so the main takeaway I think I wanted you know, to, to really get across from these um, convergence guarantees is that with this modification to the objective, uh, even in, you know, very non-identically distributed networks and with local updating and partial participation, we can show that this method is still able to converge to the, the correct answer. And we can see this as well empirically. So if we look, for example, at this Shakespeare data set that I mentioned from before, and we look at the performance of, of federated averaging, if we make this modification where we add this proximal term to the objective, we can see that this really helps us to improve the convergence behavior. So we're able to have more stable convergence, and in this case, we're actually able to converge to a better solution than the federated averaging method. As you would expect, this can become even more important when you also have the issue of systems heterogeneity. So federated averaging, as I mentioned, typically what's done is to just drop devices when they are straggling in the network. Uh, and that can really start to amplify some of the, the previous um, kind of issues with convergence that you saw with federated averaging. The first change we make in FedProx is simply we don't drop those devices. So we allow you to send that partial information. But then because we have this proximal term that's, that's helping to ensure more stable convergence, we can improve the, the convergence behavior even more. And as kind of one concrete takeaway from this, across uh, you know, a whole suite of federated data sets, what we were able to see is that by using FedProx, we were able to improve the test accuracy on average by 22%. And this is actually the absolute number uh, in terms of the test accuracy. Um, so this is quite a, a significant improvement in terms of the overall test accuracy by, by using FedProx. Let me stop here because there were a couple questions. Uh, in the previous slide, if W is a stationary point of F, then it must also be, oh wait, FK? Yeah, so if uh, W is a stationary point of little f, then um, I mean W also has to be a stationary point of capital F, right? Yes, so we're assuming that they're that they're converging to the same solution. Is that what you mean? Um, I mean that would sort of mean that and I mean if that were the case, I mean I can solve for just one of the FKs, right? Um, instead of like optimizing with the, all the functions. Hmm. 
I'm not sure what you mean by that exactly. Yeah. Um, So maybe I'll go back to the objective so <laughs> it might make things more clear. So the objective here is that we're solving some uh, weighted average of all, the, all of these FKs. So F is simply an average of all of the, the F sub Ks. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I was just saying that if like all of them have the same, uh, you know, uh, minima, then I mean, I can just optimize for one of the FKs instead of like the average of them. I see. Yes. No, that, well, this is the exact issue uh, that, that is not happening in practice, right? Because if these all had the same minima, then this would be uh, a very simple problem. Uh, the problem with local training in particular is that the, the stationary points might differ, right? Especially when you have heterogeneous data. So what you're doing with, with doing too much local training is that you could be converging to kind of different optima on each of the, the local devices. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it, for con, uh, non-convex problems, I guess it makes sense for, I mean, strongly convex, it won't work, right? Because like, if you have that, that assumption and I mean, each of them are strongly convex, then I mean, all of them must have the same minima, right? Uh, I mean, coupled with the assumption that you have made. Hmm. Yeah, the main, so the, these guarantees are particularly focused on kind of not, I guess, not the strongly convex setting. So we're thinking mostly about, uh, sorry, about convex and non-convex losses. Okay, I see. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for your question. Was there a follow-up question? I didn't see if, okay. Uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sorry, I have the same uh, same question. I think if every stationary point of the true function can be identified by the individual functions itself. Um, I mean, this is referred to as, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the stochastic optimization, this is referred as strong gradient growth condition and the variance is zero at the optimal point. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that, uh, so, I mean, and probably in practice, this is not the case. Usually you have another constant on the right-hand side which makes it differ so that you you handle this uh, uh, situation with uh, uh, different with different uh, with different uh, optimal for different uh, local solutions. I mean, different local solutions for each function. You're uh, saying that there's a constant on the right hand side of this equation with the expected value. Yeah, so there could be a constant, another constant on the right hand side of the equation, which will not allow you to show the convergence to the optimal solution unless there are other settings, but it will still, it will give you a neighborhood solution, which is kind of like a, a, a which is, a, which is a general result in the stochastic optimization in the uh, centralized settings. Got it. Um, I mean, that might be useful. You can look into it. So I, I, have, I have another like general question. So the, the federated learning, can we think of that as a, special case of decentralized distributed optimization with fully connected networks where you can get perfect consensus after every step. And then in that case, what you're looking at is uh, the effect of communications versus uh, doing multiple rounds of computations or uh, multiple rounds of gradient steps that you're taking. And there's yeah, some- Yeah, that's a very good question. So there's there's absolutely a lot of work in, in decentralized distributed optimization. And the, the key, so, this would be a special case in the sense that, you know, often you're assuming that there's one central server. So that, so you would, that would be like a specific topology to consider. Uh, but I think the, the, the key differences still hold, which is that the data is not identically distributed across those decentralized agents and that you're also performing local updating. Um, partial participation is maybe something that you could characterize in terms of thinking about the topology. Uh, but these two things in particular still uh, differentiate this from a lot of that that prior work. Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, I, we can discuss later too. So with regards to non iid data, I mean, if it's you're looking at empirical minimization, I think it's already the case that you can't converge in the distributed decentralized settings where uh, the functions, there is variance among the functions or exactly the equation that you're looking at right now in the slide is still there. And local updating is kind of, that's what I was saying, like you're trying to do multiple computations instead of just taking one gradient step or one second order step, you're doing, trying to solve certain accuracy. 
So there's uh, a little bit more overlap, I guess, than uh, 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 what I think is, is is seen, but yes, I, I agree that there could be some difference. We can discuss later too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sounds great. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be great to, to talk more later. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit more about the other areas where heterogeneity can, can play an impact on the federated learning pipeline. So uh, just to summarize with optimization, I think that the key takeaways here are, are simply that heterogeneity is, is something that's very important to consider when you're thinking about these distributed optimization techniques. So it can lead to slower convergence, it can reduce the stability of your convergence procedure, and it can lead to divergence. Uh, it's very critical thus to analyze and to evaluate these federated methods with these practical assumptions in mind. So assuming that data is not identically distributed and that there might be partial or variable participation from the various devices. So the issue of heterogeneity does not just, uh, as I mentioned, stop with optimization. So one way that it can be important to, to think about heterogeneity is in terms of the performance of the model across uh, the network after you've performed training. So what I mean by that is if, if we think about traditional empirical risk minimization, at a high level, you're trying to, to minimize some, say, average loss across the network. So each of these functions, F, correspond to a loss on a certain device. And one issue with just minimizing this objective as is, is that you might perform very well on average, but in general, there are no accuracy guarantees for individual devices. And the performance may therefore vary widely across the network. So you might be doing well on average, but at the expense of the performance on some of the devices. So here's an example with the, the Shakespeare data set that I mentioned from before. If we look at the test accuracy distribution of this model uh, trained via you know, traditional federated learning procedures using this empirical risk minimization objective, what you can see is that the, the model performance tends to do very well on average, but then on a small subset of the devices, the test accuracy is quite poor. Right? So this is sort of the, the, an issue in practice if we want to ensure some reasonable quality of service once we've actually deployed our model in this network. And the question that we asked ourselves in this work more specifically is, you know, can we encourage a more fair or uniform distribution of the model performance across devices? So ideally, while not really making sacrifices on the average performance, can we still prevent against these, these cases of catastrophic failure? In thinking about how to solve this problem, we were inspired by uh, some previous work in alpha fairness. So for a very different problem of kind of thinking about allocating resources in wireless networks. Uh, so whereas, you know, the resources in these networks might be something like bandwidth. So you want to figure out how to most, you know, fairly allocate bandwidth across your network. Here, our, you know, our intuition in, in thinking about how to extend this to the problem of machine learning is to think about the loss as the resource that you're trying to allocate. So intuitively, if the loss is higher for a certain device, then this, uh, as you're optimizing this machine learning objective, you will be spending more time trying to optimize the, the loss on that one device, right? So because we're minimizing the average performance, our, our model will, will focus more on the data points with higher loss. Okay, so using that connection, we developed the following modification to empirical risk minimization. Uh, so we're calling this QFFL or QFAIR federated learning, which is inspired by alpha fairness. And the modification is to, is to take these losses and to raise them each to some exponent. So this is nice because this is a, a tunable framework. So in the limiting case, if Q is equal to zero, this just recovers the previous objective, so the previous empirical risk minimiz minimization objective. If instead Q goes towards infinity, you, work, you, uh, you get back a traditional minimax notion of fairness. So in that definition, you're trying to minimize the worst performing loss across all of your devices. So this is something that's been used both in federated learning to understand fairness, but also in just uh, fairness for machine learning literature. So this is known as uh, representation disparity. And uh, a common way to solve the issue of representation disparity and fairness is to use this minimax objective. However, what's nice about making this tunable is that 
as you change this Q parameter, you can trade off between whether you care about kind of the average accuracy or whether you care more about imposing this strict notion of, of fairness in your network. And we show that this objective can work both empirically, we also analyze it theoretically. So we show that increasing this value of Q has sort of the intended consequence. So it results in a more uniform accuracy distribution. It helps to reduce the variance of the, the accuracy across these devices. <clears throat> Just to go back to the previous example, this kind of toy example looking at this Shakespeare data set, Again, what we have at the baseline is that we were performing well on average, but at the cost of, of a few devices. What we're able to do with this QFFL framework is to still actually perform the, the same on average, but we're significantly improving the performance of these worst performing devices. So we don't have these, you know, um, terrific <laughs> failure cases that we had previously. Okay, and this is something that we saw across the board. So if you, uh, if you look at, uh, this is an example of uh, some of the data sets that we looked at. Uh, it's a little hard to, um, you know, diagnose all of this at once, but what you can see at a high level is that the, the distribution for the red lines here uh, has smaller variance than for the blue lines, which is, you know, Q equals zero, so the previous empirical risk minimization objective. Uh, kind of a, an easier summary is that while maintaining the exact same average accuracy, so we were able to maintain the same average accuracy, but then cut the variance in half. So in terms of you know, fairness and, and accuracy, we were able to maintain the same uh, sort of metric from before in terms of looking at this, the average accuracy, but we were able to do so while providing more uniform performance across the network. Okay, more recently, we, we've actually, uh, realize that this objective and some uh, related objectives are quite useful also for other areas in machine learning. And so uh, we have recently generalized this objective um, to something that we're calling tilted empirical risk minimization. Uh, so this is uh, a slight reformulation of the objective that I had previously, but the intuition is the same. Basically, as this parameter T is, is increasing, you're going from kind of an average accuracy to a minimax objective. But in this term objective, we actually also generalize it in another way, which is that we allow the parameter t to be less than zero. And I think that the intuition for this is, is best explained in a picture. So you'll see on the left here, uh, we have an example of a linear regression problem. And what you can see is that most of the data here falls along some line, but that there are also some outlier points. And what's happening is that if we fit just a line of, you know, the traditional kind of line of best fit to this data, it will mostly fit to this data, but it will be pulled a little bit in terms of the outliers. As we set T to be greater than zero and closer and closer to infinity, we'll be solving a minimax objective. So we'll be minimizing the largest distance to any one of these points. So this would help to enforce kind of a more fair line of best fit to this data. If we instead let T be less than zero and go towards negative infinity, that will have the effect of kind of getting rid of these outlier points, right? So we'll be ignoring this outlier data instead of ensuring that we, we fairly fit to all of the data. So at a high level, you can think about what this objective is doing as uh, reweighting the samples to either magnify or suppress the effect of outliers. If we think just about you know, T being greater than zero, this is similar to what we had with QFFL. So this is a trade-off between minimizing the average loss versus the max loss. Uh, another interesting interpretation is that you can view this objective as an approximation of a superquantile method. So in superquantile methods, the goal, for example, is to, is to minimize some quantile of your losses. So for example, the median loss or the 90th percentile, for example, and you can view what, what term is doing here as a smooth approximation to those objectives. So I'm not gonna talk in, in too much more detail about uh, this, this objective, but I wanted to, to bring it up because I think that, that one thing that's nice about the federated learning space is that um, many of the problems you know, here are also fundamental problems throughout machine learning. And so this is kind of one example where we started with a problem in, in federated learning and have since explored uh, a much more general 
um, notion of the objective, which is applicable to problems like fairness and robustness and, and class imbalance. So problems that are, are issues all across the board in, in machine learning. <clears throat> okay, so kind of the, the main takeaways here I, I wanted to mention in terms of fairness so first, it's, it's just important when you have heterogeneous data to consider that vanilla empirical risk minimization may deliver poor quality of service, uh, especially again, when you have this diverse data across your network. Uh, these objectives, QFFL and TERM, they allow for a flexible trade-off between fairness and accuracy. Um, and in the, the cases that we looked at, we were able to you know, maintain our same notion of, of average accuracy, but by significantly improving the fairness across the network. Lastly, I wanted to mention that heterogeneity uh, is, is very important not only to you know, think about in terms of your optimization procedure and in terms of thinking about the final performance, but also uh, you know, right off the bat in terms of thinking about what models we actually even want to use uh, to model our data in this setting. Okay, and this is, this is work actually from <laughs> a while ago now, not that long ago in terms of the you know, the actual number of years, but in terms of the amount of time that people have been working on federated learning, it's, it's a long time ago. Um, and, you know, when we first looked at the, the problem of federated learning, this was kind of the very first question that we asked ourselves, which is, uh, how should you actually model data in this setting, right? And, and there are two extremes to consider, right? Like the, the most natural thing, I think, is that the easiest way to solve a distributed optimization problem is to completely decouple uh, the objective and just to learn completely separate local models, one for each device. So this is a very personalized model, right? You're just learning from the local data on each of the devices. The obvious downside is that some of these de devices might have insufficient data, right? Or they might be seeing only a, a small you know, portion of the world. And so it can be really nice to, to share information across the devices, right? This is what inspires the idea of, of federated learning to start with. However, the issue with learning just a single model, one global model for all of the devices, is that it's not necessarily able to uh, learn kind of personalized behavior for each of the devices in the network. And so what we might really want to do is something in between these two. We might want to learn local models, so learn kind of one model for each device, but then learn the structure between those models. So we want to share information, but maybe in a smart way where we're not just uh, you know, sharing all of the information and, and encoding it in one model. We want to both learn personal, personalized models, but also learn from peers in the network. And this sort of idea is something that's very naturally tackled via multitask learning. So in multitask learning at a high level, now instead of having one model, you have M models, one for each device in the network. And these models were fitting to the local data on each of those devices via these loss functions. However, in addition to these, these loss functions, we also have a regularization term. What this regularization term does is it takes all of the models, all of the M models, and it tries to enforce some structure between those models. And it does that through this relationship matrix known as the task relationship matrix. So there are various things that you can, can learn in, a, in an objective like this. So for example, you might learn that all of the tasks, all of the devices in your network are connected, but then what you're trying to learn is just the weights on these edges. You might learn that most of the devices are related, but that there are perhaps some outlier tasks. You might learn that clusters or groups are forming within your network, or maybe that there's some asymmetrical relationship. Uh, so in particular, that there may be some power device or power user that's generating a lot of the most imp interesting information. And so uh, what's important here is that this is not only something that, you know, you can enforce a priori if you happen to know this information, but it's also something that you can automatically learn as, as part of this learning procedure. So uh, you don't have to actually know this information beforehand. It's something, it's kind of a nice side effect that you get from running this multitask learning procedure. <clears throat> so, in, in first kind of thinking about this problem, we, uh, we looked across a, a bunch of federated data sets at both kind of the, the global, the, the two natural baselines, training a global model, training a local model, and then we looked at this multitask learning objective. 
And, and what you were able to see is, you know, because the data is often very heterogeneous, you get this, um, you get this big win from using multitask learning. So across the boards, multitask learning is, is kind of the objective that performed the best across all of these federated data sets. And so I, I wanted to bring this up because I think this is a, a, a really nice principled way to learn models that are both personalized, but also share information across federated networks. Uh, one issue with multitask learning in general is that it's not extremely scalable. Um, so there has been a lot of interesting recent work in thinking about both kind of more scalable versions of multitask learning for federated learning and also different but related paradigms like meta learning for uh, for federated settings. And I think this is a, a very important direction moving forward in order to kind of rethink our, our modeling assumptions in federated settings, especially when we have heterogeneous data. Okay, so with that, I wanted to mention just uh, a few directions of a future work. So one thing that I think is really critical is in, in many of the approaches today, I talked about the importance of heterogeneity, but in terms of actually diagnosing when heterogeneity exists, a lot of the approaches to do this uh, diagnos like diagnosing procedure are very expensive. So for example, I mentioned the gradient diversity across kind of all of the data points in the network, uh, measuring the loss across all data points, or in multitask learning, look at, looking at this task relationship matrix. So these are all kind of very expensive diagnostics. Moving forward, I think it's really important to think about other metrics that allow us to diagnose the heterogeneity in these federated networks cheaply and ideally prior to even you know, performing these training procedures. I think the ultimate goal here in order to you know, really solve the issue of heterogeneity and federated learning is, is to deliver methods that can both diagnose but then also automatically adapt to these varying levels of heterogeneity. Along this direction, I, I wanted to mention that uh, my group in, in concert with a, you know, some of the folks from the federated learning team at Google have developed LEAF. This is a benchmark for learning in federated settings. It includes uh, some open source data sets, there's also an evaluation framework with some metrics related to um, some of the statistical and systems issues in federated learning. And if you're interested, I would encourage you to check out our website, leaf.cmu.edu. Uh, but moving forward, especially in, in terms of thinking about the issue of heterogeneity, I think it's really important for, um, for the field of federated learning to get more examples of what heterogeneity looks like in real federated networks. Uh, and so if you are someone who happens to be using federated learning in, in practice or for any applications, uh, I'd, I'd love to talk to you and I'd love to collaborate. Uh, and uh, there's a, you know, a lot of need for more open source data um, that's you know, being, being used as part of some sort of federated learning system. So uh, if you're working in that area, please, please reach out. Okay, and one last thing I, I wanted to mention uh, and you may already be getting this, this spiel from, from Alex, but uh, I, I'm currently on the board for MLSYS. So this is a, a conference that's targeting research at the intersection of, of machine learning and systems. And I think this is a really important direction. It also you know, corresponds to a lot of the work that I mentioned today in that in machine learning accuracy is not and should not be the only objective. So there are a lot of additional concerns in practice, you know, related to the computation, communication, but also issues like fairness and privacy and interpretability. And a lot of these challenges, um, I think there's a lot of exciting work, you know, that's addressing these challenges at the intersection of machine learning and systems. And so if you're working in this area, I, I would highly encourage you to consider submitting to MLSYS. So the submissions are due in a couple weeks uh, on October 10th. Right. And thanks. That was all I had. And I think, yeah, it seems like we have a, a few more minutes in case you all had any final questions.